encontrarnos en Panamá. Welcome, we are very happy to be in Panama in this ninth edition of the World Economic Forum. We are celebrating the topic, opening pathways to shared prosperity. We have developed a very complete program based on three pillars, economic dynamism, social innovation, and the importance of sustainable development in environmental issues and the modernization of economy and, infrastru and institutional infrastructure. We have here with us five of our six co-chairs. I must apologize for Mr. Stanley Mota, who is not here with us today in this session. He has been a great support for conducting this activity. This morning, here are Arancha Gonzalez Laya, Executive Director of International Freight Center from Switzerland, Mr. Arif Nakvi, founder and CEO of the Brash Group with the United Arab Emirates, Fritz van Passen, President and CEO of Starwood Resorts and Hotels. We also have Mr. Jorge Quijano the Executive Director of the Panama Canal Authority, and Sir Martin Sorrell, Executive Director of WPP in the United Kingdom. Welcome and thank you very much for all your support and dynamic contribution to this session. I leave you now with Mr. Jorge Quijano. Thank you, Marisol. Thank you all for being here. It is a great pleasure for the Panama Canal Authority and for Panama because after trying for so long to get the WEF uh, to come and ha hold its forum here in Panama, as the President mentioned yesterday, this was a long process, took about five years, and we are very grateful for introducing Panama to you, introducing the Panama Canal to you and what we offer to the world and to this region specifically. As you know, we have been able to attain some 600, to get some 600 regional leaders and world leaders to participate. We truly have a lot of people from Europe and Asia. They represent more than 50 countries. And in particular, what pertains to the Panama Canal and to Panama itself, we are trying uh, to uh, work and you know, showcase what Panama offers as a logistics center for the world to show our advances in infrastructure that we are working on and the possibilities with the specific issue on the specific issue of natural uh, liquefied gas energy, especially, especially in that area of that new product that is becoming an export nowadays, specifically in the Gulf of Mexico area in the United States. Our country has a privileged position and uh, this is the one that allows us, provides us the opportunity to serve the world and uh, to uh, promote Panama as a motor for our logistics platform. We have maintained a uh, level of growth throughout the last years of approximately 8%. We see that Panama has attained through this, uh, the Panama Canal as a motor and the uh, conglomerate of the logistical opportunities, it has been able to represent a high percentage of the internal, the domestic gross product. And for Panama, uh, this area is the one that is really a motor for a country. It provides great benefits for all Panamanians. So we would like to be great promoters. And we are accomplishing this through the Panama Canal expansion, not only when we are done with the expansion at that time, you know, now we can see its impact on the Panamanian population, especially regarding employment. 
We have worked diligently not only to make the canal a route, a path, but also to make Panama a destination for business. And this is exactly what we, what the WEF allows us to showcase so that all that are interested in doing business within an environment of growing economies, of those economies that are growing the most in the world at this time, it's the Latin American ones, and I believe that the presence of the WEF here ratifies that fact. And we consider that in the future, not only our nation, our canal, but Latin America will use Panama as its location to open these economies. Thank you, Jorge. Arancha, first of all, I would like to share with you a warm thought of, you know, regarding uh, Chile uh, for President Bachelet and what Chile underwent last night, an earthquake that uh, thank, it, thanks to the higher power, it was uh, not awful. Second, to thank the WEF and Panama for its hospitality. I believe that we uh, heard Mr. Quijano state that Panama's desire to become a model for other countries in the region. And uh, I judge uh, from the welcome we received at WEF we're on the right path. Uh, the emphasis of the WEF, I would like to state, is on uh, two pillars. Number one, the importance of secure, sustainable growth on a long-term basis. It's growth that comes with reforms to improve productivity, competitiveness of the economies in Latin America, to raise the size of the wealth of each of its countries. And to, uh, I would like to highlight the role of trade. And uh, it is not a matter of luck that we happen to be in Panama. It's a country that has embraced a model of uh, opening trade. And uh, the WEF presented its enabling trade report yesterday. It gave us an idea of the efforts that the WEF is conducting in this region to improve competitiveness and promote growth. Another element, an important one that we must highlight, is the role of small and medium-sized businesses in this growth in productivity and its improvement. There were many good discussions over how to do in each of our countries to improve the position of small and medium-sized businesses in the economy. We would also like to highlight an the WEF's emphasis on empowering women economically. Women financial empowerment. The enormous role that women can play in the creation of, uh, of jobs, in generating growth, and in reducing poverty. I insist again on these topics. Uh, we need concrete ideas on how countries may include more women because they represent 50% or more of our country societies in order to include women in a better manner and more within our economies. Uh, but uh, we are also would like to talk about improving competitiveness and also on improving the distribution of the benefits in our societies and to reduce the gap, the inequality gap that you see as one of the great risks for stability in our region, in Latin America. With this, thank you. Thank you again to the WEF for its hospitality, and I am at your service. Thank you, Arancha. Arif? Uh, thank you very much for having me here, and thank you for the WEF for organizing this. I'm delighted to be here in Panama. I've been here many times over the last few years, and it's been a pleasure to see the progress of the country um, on a continuous and fairly relentless path forward. Um, however, what is fair to say is that, uh, you know, when you look at the entire region as a whole, and Panama should be very pleased that it is hosting the WEF, uh, but it is doing so as almost like a mirror for the entire Latin America region. And the last 20 years have seen a very radical change actually in the 
in the political, in the macroeconomic, and the social uh, structure environment in uh, Latin America. And this last 20 years has probably been more radical than the last 200 years. Um, the most striking thing that I've seen in my uh, knowledge or experience of this market is the rise of the middle class. The middle class in Latin America and its rise in the last decade has been remarkable, it's been striking. And the region now has more people living in the middle classes than in poverty. And this is a very, very um, important demographic shift that hasn't happened before. Also, of course, this continent and this area of Latin America has got some excellent demographics. It has a young, uh, increasingly well-educated labor force ready to take on new challenges. And the most important element, sometimes when you live in the region, you don't realize some of the things that we see from the outside. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this region is it is actually the most urbanized region in the world. Um, and therefore, it offers a potential, enormous potential for high growth. Four-fifths of the population of Latin America, actually, is now living in cities. And there is a very rapid growth in tier two cities. Now, I'm sure all of you know um, that urbanization is one of the most incredible themes of this century and for the next 40 or 50 years going forward. Half of mankind today lives in cities. This is not a new statistic. We all know that. But what we, uh, not all of us know is that we're increasing that number by about a million people a week across the world. And that's the equivalent of eight New York cities a year. And if you are so urbanized in this part of the world, it actually means that Latin America has a head start over most other regions in the world when it comes to urbanization. Because urbanization then lends us to the next big trend, which is the importance of cities at, frankly, the expense of countries. And cities are going to become more relevant. The fact that you have so many tier two cities today mean that you have an assured growth market going forward into the future as well. We've seen the growth potential of this region. Uh, we've been investing in the region for a few years, albeit in a small scale. And we're now looking forward to expanding that enormously. We have uh, a couple of investments that really prove the hypothesis that I've been making so far. IASA Corp, which is a ladies uh, clothing apparel business in uh, the Andean region, uh, Acurio restaurants, both point to the fact that you can take Latin American businesses, grow them into regional businesses, and eventually into global businesses. And that's what we're very excited about. Um, however, the whole continent is not moving forward at the same pace. Um, there's clearly a multi-speed Latin America that we're seeing emerging. Panama is by far and away the champion of this process. It's experiencing double-digit growth, um, and that's very exciting for all of us, especially with its um, impending affiliation to the Pacific Alliance. I think the Pacific Alliance is also an extremely exciting development in this region. Um, I don't, uh, once again, it's important to know that, you know, it, uh, the Pacific Alliance is already larger than Brazil in terms of population and is growing at twice the rate of Brazil. Now, this is an important fact to know because these countries together, collectively, um, have a great purchasing power and a great economic uh, capacity. And I think it's very important for the rest of the world to focus on these countries rather than on acronym investing, which is, you know, BRIC or MINT or XYZ. Each of these countries has a great ability to outperform its neighbors and competitors, and we're seeing a very positive outcome uh, for this market. So that's why, um, personally, as an investor, as a foreign investor, I'm extremely excited to be here. I'm very pleased with the fact that it is happening in Panama, which is one of the more dynamic economies in the region. A lot of my colleagues on the panel will be giving you a lot of statistics on why Panama is so exciting. I think that's a given as far as we're concerned. Um, and I'll leave you with one thought. Every region has a draw. Every region has a point that collectively pulls the region together and makes it exciting. So the Middle East region has uh, Dubai. The Central Asian region has Istanbul. The Far Eastern region has Singapore. And I'd like to say that I think going forward in the future, it's going to be Panama that is going to catalyze the opportunities in the region and pull it together. So thank you for being here, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you very, very much. Fritz, from Starwood's perspective, what can you share with us? Yes, thank you. Con permiso, voy a hablar en inglés también. I'd like to say, first of all, that I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, um, not least because there's still snow on the ground in New York. 
but, but I will tell you that uh, today I'm here both as a, as a guest to Panama, but also as a host to you as this hotel, the Westin uh, Playa Bonita, is one of 1,200 hotels that we operate around the world. We're in 100 countries. Uh, some of the other brands of ours that you may have heard of or stayed with, hopefully, would be Le Meridian, Sheraton, St. Regis, W, and of course the West in here. Uh, Aloft is another brand of ours that's expanding uh, rapidly around the world. And, and I can tell you from our vantage point that this is an extraordinarily exciting time in the high-end travel business. And I say that both from a global perspective, uh, but also seeing that those same global trends are playing out uh, in, in very positive ways in, in many countries throughout this region. Uh, and those trends primarily have to do with the rising wealth and middle class. We heard a bit about that already. And, and the, the consequence of that, of course, uh, with urbanization, the creation of infrastructure, uh, but connected to that also, the globalization of business largely enabled by technology and, and the increasing importance of travel, not just as, as a leisure activity, but as a way of connecting business. And while technology in some ways may supplant travel, it has a much greater effect at creating a global business community and connecting people. So we continue to see high-end travel growing even much faster than, than global GDP growth rates. And of course, here in Latin America, the rise of the middle class uh, the focus on building infrastructure across cities has been a catalyst for growth. Today we operate 80 hotels in, in Latin America. We see that number going to 100 in the next three years, and that's a function largely of, of those very same trends. A in many respects, Panama and the Pacific Alliance, as has been referred, are excellent examples of the way forward for the region. We have to go beyond being driven for growth by, by raw materials and see that trade and tourism by themselves uh, can in fact be very important drivers both of wealth creation, uh, of job creation, but also of further opportunities. Uh, the, the formula for growth, at least in the travel and tourism sector, as played out here in Panama, has to do with improving airlift, expanding infrastructure capacity, uh, allowing for permitting and investment to create and build hotels, uh, flexible labor laws that make it possible for us to hire and train uh, a workforce. And, 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 and all of those things here in, in Panama have played out extraordinarily well. Uh, we've been operating in the region for 45 years. Uh, we've been in South America for over 40 years. And the growth we've seen in the last decade, decade and a half here in, in Panama is, is extraordinary. Today we, we operate seven hotels uh, in this country and, and see opportunities for continued growth. So with that, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Martin? Yeah. Okay, last, last but not least, Martin Sorrell, <coughs> CEO of WPP. We are, we are currently the world's largest advertising and marketing services company. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about brand Latin America and a little bit about, uh, in that context, brand Panama. But before I do, let me put it in perspective, because just picking up on some of the things that Arif uh, mentioned, uh, some of which I agree with and some of which I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to agree with. Um, I see Latin America, or we see Latin America and WPP as being a very important part of our business. It's actually $1.7 billion of revenue uh, and 20,000 people now uh, in Latin America out of a total of about 22 billion including our associates, that's companies we own 20 to 49 percent of and 175,000 people around the world. But Latin America, just to pick up on what Arif said, and this is where I think uh, he refer referred to the mnemonics and the, the disadvantages of the sort of analysis that Jim O'Neill at Goldman Sachs, when he was at Goldman Sachs, Correct. talked about in terms of bricks and Next 11 and mints. But these, these are, Latin America is one of the regions on which we are, if I can use this phrase, betting the future of WPP. Uh, one third of our revenues as a whole come from Asia, Latin America, Africa and the Middle East, and Central and Eastern Europe. And that is the growth engine uh, of most of the multinational clients that we deal with, and the growth engine, obviously, of local and regional clients that are based in that part of the world. If you look at our business, Brazil is about half of that 1.7 billion. And whether uh, Latin Americans as a whole like it or not, Brazil is the engine currently of Latin America. 
uh, and Brazil accounts, as, as I say, for about half of, of Latin American GMP. And when, when Brazil stutters, which uh, at the moment Brazil is exhibiting a, a slower rate of, rate of growth, that has uh, an impact on the rest of the region, whether you, you consolidate the populations into Pacific alliances or, or trade agreements or not. Uh, the, the danger of doing that is rather like the EU. These are separate countries with different cultures and different philosophies. It's often difficult to get them to behave uh, in, in a unified way, and they're not actually one market. So Brazil is obviously critical in that, in that respect. Brand Latin America, in our view, is in a fairly healthy state. It has one or two challenges coming on, uh, which I will come on to, but generally, the trends that Arif in particular mentioned of urbanization, the growth of the middle class, uh, one of the things he didn't mention was the growth of digital. Interestingly, because of, because of the growth of telecommunications, mobile telecommunications in particular, what we've seen is uh, an acceleration uh, of digital and digital media uh, to an extent that we haven't seen maybe in some of the more traditional legacy countries and that we see mirrored in, China, in, in countries like China uh, and India. And the urbanization thing that Reef mentioned is very, is very important, the sort of work that we've done with IBM, for example, on Smarter Planet and Smarter Cities uh, embodies that. So I would say uh, this, uh, I would go back to, uh, to the launch of Brand Colombia that we, we did in Cartagena uh, with Luis Moreno, president of the Inter-American Development Bank, several years ago when we both talked about this being the decade of Latin America. Uh, our business last year in Latin America grew like for like, like for like, excluding currency uh, and acquisitions at 8%, which compared with a worldwide growth rate of 3.5%. This year, it's budgeted, Latin America's budgeted to grow at 11%, that's our businesses, like for like, excluding currency uh, and acquisitions. So we expect a stronger year, and that certainly has been the case in the first couple of months of the year. Let me just uh, turn quickly to brand Panama. Uh, Panama, to my mind, could well be the Singapore uh, of, uh, of Latin America. And I, I, would, I would encourage people, it's, Singapore is slightly bigger at five million population, but a very, very integrated government and a very, very integrated approach to economic development. And I think some of the lessons of the growth of Singapore uh, could, be, uh, uh, could be extremely useful in the context of Bram, Panama, or development of Panama. The developments of infrastructure, the canal, the airport, I think will challenge Miami. Uh, Miami has historically been a more convenient center in many respects for many multinationals, but I think we're starting to see the growth or the, the greater examination of Panama at least as a regional headquarters, and there are one or two shining examples of that uh, happening uh, already. Uh, so there, we, we think about Latin America, certainly at WPP, as Brazil, uh, in this order. Uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, Peru. Those are the, the key economies uh, at the moment. I just quickly go through them in terms of prospects. Brazil has slowed. The critical thing in Brazil is how the government and others execute I think, execute on the World Cup in a few months' time and the Olympics 2016. Clearly, the, the issue of inequality that's just been raised is, is important in this context. Uh, and there will be, I think, a certain amount of activism around both events, uh, drawing attention to the question as to whether such large investments should be made in these types of infrastructure at this particular point in, in time of the economic cycle. Having said that, there are discrete legacy benefits that come from a World Cup, and particularly from a, an a Olympics, which I think uh, have to be brought to people's attention in a, more, in a more articulate way. But Brazil, basically, we believe in the long term, has very strong prospects. Mexico, with energy reform in December of last year, we think is a very high growth prospect, and the, the president of Mexico will be here uh, tomorrow, and he will articulate it in a more effective way. Argentina, obviously, has some challenges. Although our own view is that these challenges, as in we've seen in the history of Argentina, presents opportunities. Colombia, very strong post the elections, the re-election of Santos. Uh, and of course, Chile and Peru, Chile smaller, about 14 million people, stable economy, but Peru, uh, very much a growth engine. I would just mention Paraguay in parentheses. It's a, it's a 
forgotten country in the context of Latin America, but we see uh, increasingly interesting growth prospects driven by the commodity price boom that we've seen uh, over the last 10 years. Just finally on the challenges. Brazil, I've mentioned, the economy has slowed, and we have the Olympics and uh, the World Cup. Venezuela, clearly there are big challenges there uh, and, and unrest. Uh, and if you look at the fundamentals of Venezuela in terms of energy and energy supply, they are extremely strong. Uh, and it, one hopes that the, the Venezuelans will, will, will improve the prospects for the economy and the country because, as I say, the fundamentals are so strong. And Argentina, uh, clearly, major opportunities there in terms of human resources in our industry. Some of the strongest creative output in the world comes from Buenos Aires and Argentina, but not just human resources, natural resources too. Uh, one thing I just mentioned finally, um, which has not been mentioned, our biggest challenge in these fast growth markets, not just Latin America, but Asia, Central Eastern Europe, uh, and, and the Middle East, and Africa, in the fourth quarter of last year was in currencies. The weakening of the fast growth currencies, the softening of the Brazilian real, the Argentina, Ar Argentinian currency, the Turkish lira, the, the, um, the Russian ruble, all of them, we saw devaluations in the Q4 of last year of anywhere between 5 and 28%. And these have to work their way through the system. This is a result of the tapering that is threatened or coming from, will inevitably come from the United States and the impact on the growth economies. That is one of the biggest short-term issues that we face as a company, but also, I think, as the region as a whole. But having said all that, uh, our view on the growth prospects of the region and the constituent countries, countries remains uh, undimmed, uh, and we remain extremely bullish on Latin America and countries such as Pan Panama as well. Thank you very, very much. That has been a very thorough presentation of different perspectives on Latin America. Uh, since we're very short in time, I would like to invite you for three questions. For those asking questions, I just remind you, be brief and be very clear about who you're addressing your question to. Si, Luis, por favor. Yes, Luis, please. Yes, I wanted to know a little bit more about the, can you, sh Guillermo Martinez from La Prensa Panama. I wanted to know a little bit, a little bit more about the social gap and specifically if you can talk about Panama. Recently in January, Oxfam published a report in which it showed that 1% of the world was keeping uh, half of world's wealth. And in that report, it showed that, I'm sorry, that the policies that governments are developing are addressed to that 1% of the world's population. I wanted to know what's your intake on that. Do you have that same idea? And could you say how that works for Panama? Who are you addressing your question to in general? To you, Ms. Argueta, and if possible, to Mr. Sorrell and Mr. Quijano as well. Thank you. I can answer part of the question. Remember that the Panama Canal is not necessarily acting as the government. We are an engine for enhancing national economy. We do not make decisions in regards as to where the investments go. I believe that the appreci appreciation that you made is very valid. The numbers or figures that you mentioned are global numbers and not necessarily the situation in Panama. So I believe we're all working towards contributing. In the particular case of the Panama Canal, every day we want to give more, not just in sense of the direct contribution made by the canal, but also we would like to be an engine behind the economy so that there is a better distribution of wealth through employment, because it's not just about subsidizing. It's also about finding a way to give opportunities so that everybody can be productive. In the subsidized environment, when you just give without giving any jobs to people, that doesn't make the country more productive. And in order to have that sustainability level that we spoke about here, we have to be a very productive country. And I don't mean that we need to have um, 
big companies. I'm saying that we need to have that engine of job creation and we need to make our efforts like any other government in Latin America and the world so that we can have the opportunities to have more balance. I add to that as well, uh, just as a spokesperson for the travel and tourism industry, uh, we represent nearly 10% of global GDP and, and employment at the same time. And what is, I think, a positive influence of our industry especially is that we create jobs in distributed locations across geographies, so second tier cities as well as capital cities. And at the same time in doing that, uh, we do it at, at probably the lowest cost per unit of investment. It's the most cost effective way for countries to create jobs and opportunities, also at entry levels. And many of our senior executives started uh, by their first job coming into the global workforce, by, by coming into the travel and tourism sector. And so uh, we, are, we see ourselves as, as a force for positive growth. Uh, today we employ about 10,000 people in our hotels uh, throughout Latin America, and we would see that number going to 12 or 13,000, and that's just our hotels. And of course, the small and medium enterprises that are again stimulated by the presence of hotels uh, and, and the influx of, of capital and cash that comes with the growth of travel and tourism, we see as a force for uh, improving the social situation uh, throughout this region and also in many of the fast-growing markets around the world. Just, uh, Arif, I think, said it very well. Um, one of the, the benefits, I mean, for example, if you look at China, if you look at India, if you look at Russia, if you look at Brazil, literally hundreds of, several hundred millions of people have been brought out of poverty uh, into the middle class. And that has happened in, you know, in the case of China from Deng Xiaoping's famous speech in 1985. So you've seen an industrial revolution which has drawn agrarian countries, primarily agrarian countries, into industrialized countries in a very short, unprecedentedly short period of time and has created the sort of tertiary industry. I was in China last week for a week uh, at the China Development Forum where this point about tertiary, uh, tertiary so service sectors like our own, like the travel and tourism industry becoming more important. However, I do agree with the point behind your question. What has happened since Lehman, uh, since the near financial collapse that we saw in September 2008, is a world of cheap money. And there are two aspects of government policy that have, uh, to some extent, created what you're talking about. That is, the, the half a percent, the one percent that owns, if it's half or whatever, uh, the proportion of the world's wealth they earn. The firstly, cheap money has benefited probably the rich more than the, the poor. The second thing is, when I left school, university in the 60s, that the prime focus of government policy was maintaining full employment. That is not the prime purpose of government po policy anymore. The prime purpose of government policy in most countries of the world is to prevent inflation. And it's the rate of unemployment that an economy will suffer Orgulloso. at zero or close to zero inflation. That's the critical issue. And you see rates of un un unemployment, which are extremely high, for example, in Spain, 25% general unemployment, 50% amongst the youth. And where I think you're absolutely right is that this is an untenable situation uh, in the longer term. That if you have 50% or even 25% or even 15%, which you tend to have, in, say, in the UK uh, or the USA of youth unemployed, that is socially unacceptable. And, and the problem is, in the private sector, there is too much of an aversion to risk. Multinational companies sit on about $4.2 trillion of cash, net cash, relatively unleveraged balance sheets post layman. And the reason is they are unwilling to take risk. Risk, taking risk is the only way that we will generate jobs, not just in the small business sector, which has been referred to before, but in the bigger industrial sector too. And I think this is a critical issue. So it, the answer to your question is, I think it's half wrong because we have seen a, a, a social revolution and it's half right because it, particularly in the short term, in, in the last five, six, seven years, we've seen inequality developing to, uh, I think, an unsustainable degree. Well, if we'd, if we'd had more time, this would have been a fabulous debate, my, Martin, because uh, although largely I agree with you, obviously there's some areas of disconnect. Um, the one thing that I do want to say to you when you ask that question is that, <coughs> you know, this whole um, exercise around quantitative easing 
is actually a reflection of governments in 2008, as Martin referred to it. Actually realizing and recognizing that this problem was too large, too structural, and too unsustainable. So you know what we did? We kicked the problem down the road, okay? By increasing the liquidity in the system to incredibly unsustainable levels, we've actually deferred the problem to day after tomorrow, not even tomorrow. And the reason why we got there in the first place was frankly greed. All of us were guilty of greed. We're now at a point where 47 countries around the world are going to be having elections in the coming 12 months. And what that means is that we're entering an era of populism, okay? Because no government wants to take the hard measures that are necessary, including the slowing down of uh, quantitative easing in order to be able to address and reflect some of the issues that they need to focus on. So again, we're not gonna have any of that, so we will continue to live in cheap money, and we will continue to live in the era where businesses will be able to access cash, and like Martin said, they'll essentially be saving their own cash and borrowing cheap money. Now, what all of this is telling me is actually something else that I refer to as the hunger of liquidity. Liquidity finds its way into some very, very weird places and some very weird outcomes. So for example, Turkey, is a country where we've all known for 10 years that the Turkish current account deficit is frankly unsustainable. It's at 90%. But why is it that all of a sudden, this year, there's this massive run on the currency, again, going to back to a point that you mentioned, and all of a sudden, people are beginning to get concerned about the resilience of the Turkish economy. The reality is that the hunger for liquidity has moved elsewhere, and people are now beginning to look at the Turks as being a politically unsustainable system. So politics, finance, and society today are coming together in a way that is absolutely unintangible, unintangible. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say. Unravelable. <laughs> and, and we're in a scenario which is very interesting because the world is becoming more globalized. So I think we should watch this space we haven't finished the issues around social change yet. Lucy, do we have time for one last question? There's one at the back there. Prob probably one very short and a very short answer, just to conclude. We don't okay. do short answers. Alicia Gonzalez from El País, Spain. My question is very specific to Mr. Quijano. You have spoken of the importance of the enhancement of the canal. What is the economic impact of the delay in such works? And do you believe that this final agreement will be the last one? And is the new date that has been set the final date? Yes, any kind of delay in the works will definitely constitute for us a cost, an additional cost, because we as expected that before the end of this year, we would be aligned with our new um, canal. So the impact is significant. We estimated that for the first year, uh, due to the lack of operation of such structures, will represent about 300 300 million dollars for the Panama Canal yearly. On the other hand, if the agreement that we have re reached is the final one, well, I can say that I hope that this new commitment uh, on behalf of the Panama Canal and not just the contractor who we deem are very serious and that is a legally binding document, we hope that they understand that they are exposed to any lawsuits in the event that they breach such agreement. We know that there have been uh, different moves made by both parties to reactivate the works. We are not at 100% at this time, but today we are at least having the production levels that we had back in October and back in November and way beyond the levels that we had in December, January and definitely in February when it completely stopped. So we believe that the solution that has been found for this issue has been the most reasonable one given that at this point the contractor still has uh, a space to set any claims that they might have and as we have insisted 
since October, November, and December, everything had to be done according to the contract, and so the Panama Canal would always be facing any contractual obligations that we might have obtained against uh, third parties. Thank you very much. We now conclude this press conference.